I tried to join the dots a bit between some of the things people have been saying around militarized policing and um, empire and imperialism and kind of um, particularly around the question of borders and bordering. Um, and I also just want to start by thanking Amina so much for her really um, moving um, opening to this event. And I really like sort of how she talked about kind of think everything starting with kind of an act of love or like a radical act of love. Um, I hope that, yeah, everything we do starts from that place of feeling um, uh, before moving on to analysis, which of course has a lot of feeling in it too, but I think it's so great that you opened in that way um, with, that, with, with, with that poetry. Um, so yeah, like the other speakers, I agree that um, Britain can't be understood or analyzed or responded to um, with any kind of transformative agenda without a reckoning with its past. Um, so if it's colonial history and that of its recent imperial invasions were to be put front and center, Britain would actually be understood as something other than what it is. It wouldn't be seen as a legitimately bordered sovereign nation state, but actually as an ongoing colonial entity in which racialized people in and outside its seemingly post-imperial borders continue to be made subject to the most brutal forms of state racial terror. Racist violence enacted by the police today can only be understood in the context of Britain's colonial history and its imperial wars. The 2003 invasion of Iraq led to the death of more than 2 million people and the destabilization of the region and was driven, as Paul Gilroy has noted, by imperial nostalgia and misplaced notions of grandeur. The war on terror has, in turn, seen the enactment of counter-terror policing and surveillance measures, which are invoked to justify institutional violence, ranging from monitoring and reporting of individuals in workplaces, schools um, under the PREVENT program, but also to extrajudicial killings by, police, um, by the police of so-called terror suspects in the street. Britain's borders and their enforcement through immigration laws um, have their origins in British colonialism. Um, and similarly, militarized forms of policing in Britain also have their, their origins in British colonialism. So in British colonies, there was no clear distinction between the police and the military. The military was called on for law and order purposes with murderous consequences in places like Jamaica, Malaysia and Kenya when people rose up against British rule. And we can see that these boundaries continue to be blurred um, in respect of racialized people in the imperial metropole today. Um, who are constructed as unruly or threatening and are subject to a very specific kind of militarized um, policing, like being disproportionately um, subject to extrajudicial killing, subject to mass arrests, stop and search. And of course, that militarized form of policing, um, which applies to racialized people specifically, is very different to the kind of policing by consent model that is assumed to apply um, to white British people. And I think this is particularly concerning in the current moment with the rise of authoritarianism that we've seen globally over recent years. And that has been exacerbated in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, which of course has seen um, the introduction of tranches of new measures designed to strengthen executive power and control over people's lives. This kind of reinforcing of executive power is also taking place, as we know, in a kind of post-Brexit political landscape, which is characterized by a growing and insistent call for military intervention to address perceived social problems in Britain itself and not just outside. So in March 2019, then UK Defence Secretary Gavin Williamson said, the UK armed forces stand ready to intervene in the knife crime epidemic and that the Ministry of, Defense, Ministry of Defense is always ready to help any government department. And a year later, at the outset of an actual epidemic, the Daily Express reported that up to 20,000 military personnel are being put on standby in a new COVID support force that could backfill police counterterrorism roles, act as prison guards, or help with border force checks. And the army is habitually called on to defend the nation in, in times of existential crisis. It's assumed to have the special ability to distinguish between full citizens and hidden enemies. If the structures of entitlement seem to be in a mess, the army promises to be among the last institutions to know who is the us that deserves protection and who requires exclusion, expulsion and incarceration. So at the same time, calls for um, a paramilitary intervention to deal with social problems or perceived social problems um, they're reinforced by this widespread social obligation to honor the armed forces and official versions of their history. The compulsory requirement that we honor, respect, and remember our boys constructs the soldiers as the model British citizen 
um, with, which is a central tenet, of course, of militarism um, and itself is, an, again, a reassertion of the nation. And in Britain, we can see that since the 2003 invasion of Iraq, there's been a concerted effort to ensure that the armed forces are honored and memorialized and made visible. And of course, erased from these official commemorations of war is the anti-war sentiment that we know very well ran through so many political and cultural responses of people who actually lived through the time of that conflict. So I wanna to try to connect some of this context of imperial war um, to, to the question, as I mentioned, of, um, of bordering um, in Britain. And so I questioned at the outset um, whether Britain could be considered a, a legitimately bordered um, sovereign nation state. And I argued that it's, a, that it's actually, it remains a colonial entity, um, which, um, is, uh, which functions by preventing people who have um, colonial histories of dispossession or people with more recent imperial um, war histories of dispossession from being able to access um, Britain. And it uses modes of militarized policing, as I discussed, to kind of police Britain's white nationalist boundaries, but it also uses methods, other methods of internal bordering and state neglect and social murder, as we've seen with um, the hostile environment um, and also um, the Grenfell Tower fire. Um, so as the British Empire was defeated, um, successive British governments introduced immigration controls, which withdrew the rights of racialized Commonwealth citizens and British colonial subjects um, from being able to enter um, the British mainland. And um, it's going to get a bit legal now, but just briefly, because it is quite important to understand um, how the law um, needs to be seen um, as embedded with and actually as a form of um, colonial violence um, um, as being itself racial violence. So the legal concept that was introduced in the 1971 Immigration Act was that of patriality. And it said that only people born in Britain or with a parent born in Britain had a right to enter and live in Britain. So it made whiteness intrinsic to British identity. And in 1971, when this act was passed, a person born in Britain was 98% likely to be white. So the act, the effect of the act was pr to prevent the vast majority of racialized colonial and former colonial subjects from traveling to and settling in Britain. Then we had the 1981 British Nationality Act, um, and this continued this process of racial exclusion by constructing the British citizen um, on the very same concept of patriality. Um, so it tied citizenship to the right of entry and abode, and um, essentially saying that Britain is a post-imperial, territorially defined and circumscribed place. And the Home Secretary at the time actually said, this message, um, this act is supposed to send a message to people who have any kind of history um, or connection to the British Empire. It's supposed to send them a message that that doesn't mean they belong in Britain or have any right to come to Britain. Um, so the move was really materially and symbolically significant. Um, a territorially distinct Britain and a concept of citizenship that makes Britishness commensurate with whiteness makes it very clear that Britain, the landmass and everything within it belongs to Britons who are understood intrinsically as being white. Um, and, but of course this 1981 Act, just despite the, um, what the Home Secretary said at the time, it didn't end um, colonialism. What it was, it was itself an act of colonial appropriation. It was a final seizure of the wealth and infrastructure that Britain had secured through centuries of colonial conquest. So the effect of the act was this questioning of racialized people's entitlement to be present in Britain. And we see this questioning um, mutually reinforced through street and institutionalized forms of racial violence. Um, so what, what essentially what the act um, declared with Britain being this distinct and legitimately bordered nation state um, with white British citizens um, uh, sort of um, recruited into policing um, Britain's new white nationalist boundaries. And Britain kind of needed an implementation of a domestic form of colonialism in order to maintain this kind of newly created um, um, nation state. Um, so essentially, um, the enactment of immigration nationality laws, which excluded racialized Commonwealth and colony citizens, was this crucial transitionary move from a kind of primitive accumulation via overseas extractive colonialism, form of colonialism, to a more justificatory form of colonialism that sort of said, we can, build, we can pull up the drawbridge now, the empire is something of the past, they kind of perform this vanishing act, and um, 
um, people begin to forget um, the, the relevance of the empire in the everyday sort of remaining colonial, very much still in place colonial configuration that Britain is. Um, so Britain um, has long projected this notion of itself as being under siege by racialized Commonwealth citizens, a kind of idea that, look, we have to pull up the drawbridge because they all want to come here and take, um, and, and take what we've got. Um, Paul Gilroy writes that black settlement has been continually described in military metaphors which offer war and conquest as the central analogies for immigration. Such descriptors of Commonwealth immigration have included the unarmed invasion, alien encampments, alien territory, and the new Commonwealth occupation. The idea that racialized people posed a threat to Britain carried, of course, serious consequences for Commonwealth citizens and colonial subjects and their descendants who were already living in Britain. As Gilroy notes, once alien cultures came to embody a threat, which in turn invited the conclusion that national decline and weakness have been caused by the arrival of racialized people. Deport deportation then becomes possible, as did the enactment of internal forms of racialized exclusion of those who could not easily be removed. So internal bordering then becomes this new mode of colonialism, which produces and sustains the post-imperial project of white Britain. Um, and we can see internal bordering um, through the institution of policy and legal regimes, which, which um, construct a border in every street. So borders follow people around when they try to access work, welfare, health, um, any kind of labor protection. And these borders um, are policed by anyone um, everywhere, whether government agencies, private companies, landlords, individual citizens. And of course, we saw this really clearly with the hostile environment policy um, um, which was introduced in the 2014 Immigration Act, which saw people being deprived um, in their thousands of access to vital um, services, housing, healthcare, education, and of course being detained, deported with um, sometimes fatal consequences. Um, so racial exclusion therefore manifests not only at the external border, but also internally, internally as racialized people um, become confined to sites of extreme deprivation, predominantly in the inner cities. Um, and in these places, the police are the ones who are recruited to then brutally enforce Britain's newly articulated white nationalist boundaries. Um, and so we saw when Britain transitioned from an empire to a nation state, how young black people were demonized and constructed as criminals, as um, Kojo has talked about, and how police violence and harassment was enacted with impunity in racialized neighborhoods. Um, the 1824 Vagrancy Act in the 70s and 80s was um, kind of revived um, to, in order to, um, to operationalize the use of sus laws, which we know today as stop and search, um, in order to disproportionately um, target um, and harass um, the, the racialized um, subjects living in Britain. Um, and so this post-imperial assertion is, is, is crucial to understand it, is to understanding the meaning um, of police harassment of racialized people. And Nicole M. Jackson says that when police officers as representatives of the state harassed black youth with stop and search arrests, they reinforced the idea that black people do not belong in England. To be English was to be white. Without a claim to residence or the hope of full assimilation, Black Britons were cast as the perpetual other within the nation, a colony within the metropole. Mm. So it was widely considered by Black communities that this Vagrancy Act had been brought back specifically to harass young Black um, people in public spaces. Um, um, the use of stop and search um, demonstrated very clearly and still does this redrawing of the boundaries of the nation um, versus um, a legit, an illegitimate citizenry. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've just got one, well, just one minute left. So two years, uh, so two years before the 1981 Brixton uprising, we can, for example, see similar, um, uh, similar patterns as we've seen now, um, which have sort of um, um, led to um, uh, the BLM uprisings or kind of kept these sort of um, uprisings as part of a long history of anti-colonial uprisings where we saw disproportionate use of, of, of harassment of young um, black people in the streets. Um, so just to conclude, the militarized forms of policing that target racialized people in the imperial metropole today both mirrors the policing of Britain's former subjects in its colonies and has always worked to reinforce Britain's post-colonial articulation of its borders. And it's for us, um, and I think as this event so well recognizes, as anti-racist scholars and activists, to actually do that work of connecting the dots between the intersecting issues around the arms trade 
um, to include questions of bordering, climate change, policing, empire and war, um, so that we can really understand and work together towards developing these strategies to resist um, global and nationalist, um, national forms of militarized um, um, policing and imperialism. Thanks.